So Dylan Dong is a third year grad student here at Caltech, and today he'll be talking to us about his favorite things, which are radio astronomy and things that look weird in the radio astronomy sky. All right, let's give it up one more time for Dylan. Okay, uh, as Mia said, I am a third year grad student at Caltech Astronomy, and today I'm going to be talking about the dynamic radio sky. And so this talk is going to be a talk in three parts. Uh, at first, I'm going to start out with how light is actually multicolored. Uh, it shines in many, many different colors, many of which your eyes can't see. And one of these, my favorite one, is radio waves. Uh, and then talking a little bit more about radio astronomy, I'm going to talk about how uh, radio astronomy was developed and how it grew over time into this uh, really cool field that we have today. And <coughs> in part three, I'm going to be talking about some of the really interesting things that we see in the radio sky, including how they change over time. OK, so let's get started. The many colored sky. So <laughs> maybe the most familiar color of light, I'm going to call these colors. You can think of them as wavelengths or frequencies or flavors of light, uh, is visible light. And this is the kind of light that your eyes can see. And so this cat, as you can see, uh, is shining uh, or reflecting light in visible light. But <coughs> if you look a little bit redder from what you can see, uh, you can look at this cat in the infrared. And what you're seeing is actually the heat given off the body heat of this cat. And you can look a little bit redder, and you end up getting uh, this flavor of light that we used to cook our food called microwaves. And look a little bit bluer than visible light, and you get this flavor of light, this color of light, that you have to apply sunscreen to block, this ultraviolet light. And thankfully, ultraviolet light doesn't actually penetrate our skin, but x-rays do. And we use this to do medical imaging. Even bluer than that, we have gamma rays, which are a kind of light that you see mostly in nuclear reactions. So various atomic processes will give up these super, super energetic gamma rays. And of course, my favorite kind of light, radio light. Uh, so you might be familiar with radio light from just driving around and listening to your car radio, right? If you drive around LA, you might be familiar with like 102.7 KISS FM. <laughs> and if you ever wondered what those numbers meant, uh, 102.7 actually refers to the frequency that that radio station is broadcasting at. It's 102.7 megahertz. And if you uh, point at it on the diagram up there of the electromagnetic spectrum, it falls squarely in the radio band. So just to recap, light comes in many different flavors. And of course, as astronomers, we've built telescopes to look at all these different flavors. And why did we do that? This is because the universe shines in all of these colors. So here is a picture of the entire sky all at once in the visible band, in visible light. Basically, you, we stitched together pictures that were taken around the world. And just to get yourselves oriented, uh, who knows what that band of light in the middle is? Just shout it out. Yeah, yeah, it's the Milky Way. This is our galaxy. This is where we live. Uh, and in the center of this image is the center of our galaxy. It just happens to be that this is in galactic coordinates, and uh, that's how we've defined it. And some cool other features in this map are our nearest neighbors, two little dwarf galaxies that happen to be orbiting around the Milky Way called the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. And so when I first saw images like that, I was actually kind of confused as to like how I might want to interpret what I'm looking at. So here's a little crash course on how to look at an all-sky map. So think of like a map of the Earth. right? The sky you can think of as a sphere. Uh, you can look around in any direction. And the Earth is also a sphere. So you take a map of the Earth in an oval like that and think about just stitching together the two sides and sort of smushing it into a ball. Right? And that's really what you should think of these all-sky maps as. You take the all-sky map and you stitch it around, and you end up with what astronomers call the celestial sphere. Here you can see uh, all the constellations, and here you can see uh, the band of the Milky Way as it would look like when you wrap it around and stitch it around. OK, so <coughs> back to the all-sky map. This is what uh, 
the sky looks like in visible light. As you can see, there's lots of light coming mostly from stars from our galaxy. However, there are these dark streaks that are just uh, going across the galaxy. And these are dust lanes. Dust is actually really, really good at absorbing visible light. It blocks a lot of that light. But if you go a little bit redder and you look in the near infrared, you can cut through most of the dust. So just go back to the visible light for a second. You see all these dark patches. And then all of a sudden, you see right through them in the infrared. Now when you go all the way to the blue side and look at gamma rays, you have also the disk of the galaxy. Uh, it's much flatter. And here you're seeing mostly cosmic rays. Uh, when you go all the way to the red side and you look at microwaves, uh, you can see actually the dust not at blocking the light, but glowing. Uh, and you can sort of see these sort of swirls uh, way above the disk, and that's sort of tracing the magnetic field of the Milky Way. Uh, you also see that in the radio as well, all these swirls. So you can spend an entire like hours talking about all the rich information contained in all these images. But we don't have time for that. So let's just zoom into one particularly interesting part, which is the center of our galaxy. So what if you were to do that in visible light? What would that look like? Uh, turns out it looks something like that. <laughs> it's just a blob. Uh, there's very little that you can actually see. And this is because you're blocked by so much dust. It's like trying to look through a brick wall. Uh, and I'm sorry that the slide is kind of cut off at the bottom. Uh, but along some lines of sight to the edge of the galaxy, uh, or sorry, to the center of the galaxy, uh, you're blocked by so much dust. Uh, the amount of light that gets through is reduced by a factor of like, you know, one with like 20 zeros behind it. And so you see nothing. But what if you were to do that same thing on the radio? What would that look like? Here's a recent image that came out. Uh, by the Meerkat collaboration from South Africa. And you see that there's actually really cool stuff going on in the center of the galaxy. It's this super chaotic place. You know, there's all these swirls and all these bubbles. So let's take a poll. Uh, well, first of all, let's talk about how radio light, one of the coolest things about it is that it passes through all this dust like it's nothing. It's just way too long wavelength, and the dust is really small, and so it just zooms right through it. But let's take a poll. Uh, what actually lives in the center of the galaxy? What's contained in this radio image of the center of the galaxy? Is it giant gas clouds, massive stars, supernova remnants, a supermassive black hole, or all of the above? So raise your hands. Who thinks it's A, giant gas clouds? Don't be shy. Cool, got to see a few hands. Uh, who thinks it's B, massive stars? A few hands. Uh, supernova remnants, anyone? OK. Uh, a supermassive black hole. A lot of hands here. Uh, all of the above? All of the above. <laughs> all right, so giant gas clouds. The thing marked A right there, that's a giant gas cloud. It's Sagittarius B2. Uh, it's really cool. There is an echo that was observed recently off of it that shows activity from the central supermassive black hole that happened a long time ago. I think it was like. Uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago. I don't remember exactly. Uh, B here, uh, this is a massive star cluster right in the center of our galaxy. These three little blobs surrounding C, those are all supernova remnants of massive stars that exploded in the past in the center of our galaxy. Right there, uh, in the brightest part of this image, uh, is a supermassive black hole that happens to live in the center of our galaxy. And of course, the answer most of you were right. Uh, actually, all of you were right. Uh, whichever you voted for, you were right. <laughs> the answer is all the above. OK, so we didn't always know about how the universe shines in all these different colors. And we certainly didn't always know about the center of the galaxy. How did we find out? This takes us to part two, which is the birth and the growth of radio astronomy. So one of the first radio telescopes looked like this. It's just like all these antennas that were sort of uh, welded together. And here you see like uh, some tires uh, on this rotating uh, platform. These are actually like uh, Ford Model T tires. 
remember this is 1931. Uh, and so the person who built this was Carl Jansky. Was, he was a radio engineer at Bell Labs. They were interested in you know, trying to see what kinds of interference you might get when you try to transmit radio waves across the Atlantic to communicate. But of course, uh, whenever you're looking at the universe in a way that nobody has looked at it before, here's the first radio telescope, you have to wonder, what are you going to find? What's out there? And so one of the main things that Jansky found was lightning strikes. So if you sort of uh, listen uh, to, or just look at the output of this radio telescope, you'll, he you'll hear clicks. You'll see like little spikes. And these are actually from lightning strikes that are happening, not just nearby. You can actually see lightning strikes from all the way across the globe. Uh, actually, I've heard, I, ac I haven't actually tried this myself, that if you take an AM radio and you tune it to one of the lowest frequencies you can get to, maybe like 100 kilohertz or so, uh, and you sort of just point it around, you'll, you'll hear these clicks. Uh, and some of them will actually be thunderstorms that are happening in Africa. So maybe some of you will have a nice long weekend and <laughs> want to go out and uh, get an AM radio and try this for yourself. I probably will at some point, too, when I get the chance. OK, so Jancy found a lot of lightning strikes. Uh, but also, there is this weird radio static, this sort of buzz that just shows up like every 24 hours of clockwork. Uh, and what could that be? It's not lightning strikes. You don't expect you know, every 24 hours there's a storm exactly at that time. Right? Uh, so what could it be? Well, one thing that shows up every 24 hours is the sun. And, so, and indeed, it sort of uh, happened to be sort of in the direction of the sun. And so that was the going hypothesis. But then after a few months of observation, I uh, found out that it wasn't actually exactly 24 hours. It was 23 hours and 56 minutes. And so who knows the difference between 24 hours and 23 hours and 56 minutes? Yeah, I see some hands. Yeah. Four minutes, true. <laughs> so uh, those four minutes actually uh, turn out to be the difference between uh, a star day, or what astronomers call the sidereal day, and a sun day, which is like the day that you're all used to. Right? And that four minutes accounts for actually the Earth orbiting around the sun. So the sun comes around every 24 hours, but the stars come around every 23 hours and 56 minutes. And so this tells you that whatever it is, it's coming from outside the solar system. Uh, and so it's not the sun. And so uh, it turns out that the sun actually moves over time as well. And uh, the actual direction that it was coming from is the center of the galaxy. And so the paper published, great title, uh, Electrical Disturbances Apparently of Extraterrestrial Origin. <laughs> uh, and by extraterrestrial here, uh, actually didn't end up meaning aliens, although that was one of the possible hypotheses at the time. Turned out that after a few decades, we came to understand that it was from the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And this is actually one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. Uh, so there are many other cool uh, discoveries that happened in radio astronomy in the early days. So here, Jocelyn Bell Brunel, who was a student, a graduate student at the University of Cambridge, uh, helped build this gigantic radio telescope. And back then, they had all these like uh, pieces of paper that a pen would just write to whenever it received some radio waves. And so uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell was super, super hardworking and super uh, you know, like clever in that she could spot the difference between the thing marked CP1919 and the thing marked interference. And it turns out the thing marked interference is actually just like your local radio station broadcasting whatever it's broadcasting. But CP1919 is this really cool thing that just uh, happens to be a blip of radio emission every 1.3 seconds, like clockwork, going around and around. This is actually the first pulsar that was ever discovered. Pulsars are these super dense corpses of stars called neutron stars. They're highly magnetic. And they've got two little uh, lobes, these uh, things that sort of spin around like lighthouses. And every time one of them hits the Earth, uh, you get this blip. And so Jocelyn Belvernal discovered the first pulsar. And just from, 
just from looking at data. Nobody was expecting this kind of discovery. And so the discoveries just kept piling on. And eventually, uh, radio astronomy grew to the point where Congress is persuaded to build this really cool instrument, my favorite instrument, called the Very Large Array. Now, the Very Large Array looks like this. Uh, it's a bunch of uh, giant antennas sitting in the high plains of New Mexico. This is actually where it's located, sort of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the two towns on Google Maps that are closest to the Very Large Array are Datil, which I've never been to, population 54, and uh, Magdalena, which I actually have gone to, population 926. Magdalena actually has some pretty cool rodeos. Uh, so if you're driving past the Very Large Array, one of the things you notice is that they're all just these cows just like, you know, munching on the grass nearby, right? This is like farmland, uh, way in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <coughs> But there are also these giant radio telescopes. And for scale, here's a picture that I took of one of them uh, while it was being maintained. Uh, you can see a little van in the bottom and a little a gigantic uh, railroad cart that basically transports these antennas uh, to and from the storage shed and also along rails so that the array of radio antennas can be reconfigured. And here's an aerial view. The very large array consists of these 27 radio dishes. And together, uh, you can combine their signals to act like a much bigger telescope. What that gives you is it gives you much, much finer resolution. You can see much smaller details on the sky. And this has been one of the most productive instruments in the history of astronomy. And it's even gotten some attention from uh, popular media, such as the movie Contact, uh, starring Jodie Foster. I definitely remember watching this in high school. And there's this one super dramatic scene where you know, she finally receives signals from aliens. And she's like reading out the coordinates, like right ascension, 1947, 32, you know, declination, whatever. Uh, and I had actually just learned what those terms mean. Those are just like coordinates on the sky. And I was like, wow, maybe I too can one day be like Jodie Foster and find aliens. <laughs> Alas, I haven't found any aliens yet, nor has anybody else, but we're looking. OK, so uh, one of the coolest things that the VLA has done, the Very Large Array has done, <coughs> is this all-sky survey, uh, which, is titled, which is called NVSS. Now, astronomers love acronyms. Uh, NVSS actually stands for the NRAO VLA Sky Survey. And NRAO is the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. The VLA is the Very Large Array Sky Survey. So it's like an acronym in an acronym. If you, if you hang around astronomy, uh, astronomers enough, you'll, you'll find many of these acronyms. Anyways, what it was was uh, astronomers decided to point the Very Large Array at every single direction of the sky and make a map of the entire sky. Well, almost the entire sky. There's this giant hole, as you can see. Uh, who knows what that is? <laughs> no, somebody did not put their thumb on the image. Uh, actually, what that is is a hole uh, due to the inconvenient uh, fact that there is a wall of rock that we happen to be standing on called Earth that uh, the Very Large Array can't actually look through. So uh, there is a part of the sky in the southern sky that you actually can't see from New Mexico. So it's a map of almost all the sky. But <coughs> this led to basically like, if you're interested in any particular part of the sky, you can just go look at uh, NVSS and just see, you know, what does it look like in radio waves? What's out there? However, uh, this is from the 90s. Some big questions still remain. Uh, NVSS was not very high resolution. Uh, what does the radio sky look like in high resolution? So here's an example. Uh, this is a visible light image on the right. NVSS kind of just looks like blobs. And so recently, it was decided that the VLA would use modern technology, a lot of which was developed at Caltech, to do a new sky survey called, very creatively, the VLA Sky Survey, not to be confused with the NRAO VLA Sky Survey. <laughs> and uh, the VLA Sky Survey is like so much more high resolution than NVSS. You can see that instead of two big blobs, you, uh, those two galaxies end up being these radio galaxies that have giant jets shooting out of their central supermassive black holes. 
That's one of the things that you can get when you look at the universe in high resolution. Another big question is, uh, NVSS only had uh, one observation of any particular part of the sky. Uh, but the sky actually does change over time. So how does it change over time? And so the VLA Sky Survey is actually going to look at the entire sky several times over from 2017 to 2019, actually finishing up at the end of the month. It's going to look at the entire sky for the first time. 2020 to 22, it's going to look at it again. And 2022 to 2024, it's going to look at it a third time. And part of what I'm working on at Caltech is I'm basically making a catalog of the two million sources that it's going to find and seeing which ones have appeared or disappeared in the sky. So how does the sky change over these several years? And this is sort of like uh, the early days, right? This is an unexplored part of astronomy where we really don't know what we're going to find. Uh, what will we find? Here are some examples. Uh, so one of the things that we definitely are going to find is black holes. So when you look up in visible light, uh, you see lots of points in the sky. And almost all of these points are stars. Right? You zoom in enough, and it looks something like that. Uh, this is an artist's impression. Actually, it's probably an image of the sun. Uh, however, if you look up with radio eyes, you see a, a bunch of points too. But instead of being stars, most of these points are actually black holes. And these black holes are shooting out jets at nearly the speed of light, look like that. And these jets shine very brightly in the radio. And these jets, it turns out that they're actually constantly evolving. So here's an actual video taken from real data of the black hole at the center of this galaxy called M87. Uh, and you can see this animation here. It's sort of frothing and bubbling, and the black hole is shooting out uh, all of these uh, ever-changing jets as a function of time. And sometimes, uh, and these jets are often you know, provoked by gas being swallowed up by the black hole. But sometimes, instead of just swallowing up loose gas, entire stars get too close to the black hole, and they get ripped apart. So here's a simulation of what that looks like. Uh, so the white dot there is an unfortunate star, and the blue dot is the supermassive black hole. So I'm just going to let this play. So what happens is the star gets too close. The black hole has really, really strong tides, just like the tides that the moon pulls on the Earth's oceans with. And those tides actually end up first flattening the star like a pancake and then ripping it apart. And half of the star gets shot out, just completely ejected in this giant tail like that. And half of the star gets eaten up by the black hole. And in rare cases, maybe a few percent of the time, that can launch new jets in processes that we really don't understand at all. Uh, and so this is called the tidal disruption event. How often does this happen? We don't even know. Uh, I think we've found like two or three of them that have shown radio emission that have shown these new jets being launched. And the VLA Sky Survey uh, is going to be an engine to try and find more of these events and help us understand where they come from and how often they happen. So another one of my favorite topics is massive stars. So massive stars uh, shed a lot of gas as they age. Right? Here is a beautiful Hubble Space Telescope image of this bubble nebula. Here in purple dots are massive stars, and one of them is actually shooting out this gigantic bubble of winds. It's just gas boiling off of the surface of the super hot star, uh, and it's just plowing through the nearby gas. So usually it's in these like slow and steady winds, and this is kind of calm, but sometimes they shed it in giant eruptions. Uh, and so this is my favorite star, actually. It's actually a pair of stars called Eta Carinae. Uh, and this is also real data. This is images from the Hubble Space Telescope taken in 1995 and uh, 19, let's see, 1995, uh, 2001, and 2008. And you can see actually in real time this uh, giant bipolar outflow growing over time. You really don't get to see this very often in astronomy. 
And so what actually caused this giant outflow, it turns out that eta carinae had a great eruption. So one of the earliest observations of this star was in 1686. Uh, it's sort of halfway on the brightness scale between barely visible with the naked eye and the brightest star in the sky. And then in 1750, it started growing brighter. And in 1830, it grew a little bit brighter still. But then in 1845, all of a sudden, it is actually a full magnitude brighter than the brightest star in the sky because it was going into outburst. And then all of a sudden, uh, in you know, maybe like 10 more years, it, it basically dropped down to the point where you couldn't even see it with your naked eye. Uh, and then it had a little mini outburst again, and then it dropped back down to where you couldn't see it again in 1920. And it's been on this slow and steady rise ever since, uh, out to about 2015, and it's continuing to rise now. And so what caused this great eruption? This is one of the giant outstanding mysteries of stellar evolution. Nobody knows, but there's this really cool paper that came out last year that uh, basically gives us one possibility. So I'm just going to play this video for now. And I'll, I'll go through it again and uh, explain it. But first, enjoy. So you have two stars orbiting each other. And then a third star is going around. One of them evolves and grows really large into a supergiant and starts losing its atmosphere to a companion. And then all of a sudden, its companion interacts with that third star and gets slingshotted out. And that other star, the third star, starts to go into the giant atmosphere and merges with the main star. And that merger is what the authors of this paper think are driving this outflow. And so this is a super convoluted scenario. Uh, however, uh, we have beautiful data on uh, what's actually going on. You have to explain this giant uh, outflow. You have to explain the shape. You also have to explain the fact that there is this star that's just on this eccentric orbit going around the main star in the center. And so you know, this is actually one of the simplest ways that you could explain something like this. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, potentially, this is one of the ways that uh, massive stars can lose uh, gas over time. And so one of the things that people wonder is massive stars tend to go supernova. They tend to blow up at the end of their lives. And so, you know, how does that actually, uh, what does it actually look like when something that has lost this much mass goes supernova? Well, uh, the gas is actually expanding out at about 2 million miles an hour. Uh, however, supernova expands out at about, you know, 100 million miles per hour. And so what happens when that 100 million miles per hour catches up with the expanding gas? It's going to look like a progressively worse traffic jam, right? Like if you've ever been driving on the highway and you sort of just uh, have to slam on the brakes because of terrible LA drivers, uh, that's, that's what, it, what it looks like. Except the gas can't actually slam on the brakes. It's just going to collide. And eventually, you get this giant collision that is going to light up the sky when it finally does blow up. All right. So the last part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about one of the things that really motivated my thesis, which is the search for hidden explosions. Uh, here we have uh, this artist's impression of a gamma ray burst, of a long gamma ray burst which is what happens in certain rare types of supernovae where uh, the cores of the star actually collapse probably into black holes and then start launching jets that are going to burrow through the star at close to the speed of light. Uh, and very recently, we found out that uh, collisions of uh, these stellar corpses, these neutron stars that I was talking about earlier, generate these jets too. And so this is actually. Uh, emitting gravitational waves right now, and all of a sudden, boom, here comes a jet. Uh, and this is one of the coolest events of the last few years. This is the uh, gravitational wave with an electromagnetic counterpart. And so one of the things that I'm trying to answer with my thesis is, well, uh, if these jets are point pointed towards Earth, you're going to detect it in gamma rays, in x-rays, in visible light. But what happens when it's not pointed towards Earth? Turns out that one of the only ways that you can actually see this light is in the radio. And so it sort of begs the question, how many of them are we missing just because the jets aren't pointed towards Earth? 
how many hidden explosions are there out there? We don't know, but hopefully the VLA Sky Survey will help us find out. So in summary, uh, this talk has been in three parts. The sky shines in many colors, uh, from radio waves to gamma rays. Uh, some of the coolest discoveries are made by just looking out there in a way that nobody's looked before and <coughs> looking for the unexpected. And the radio sky is full of really cool things. And a lot of them are changing with time. And so I just want to leave you with this. Uh, this is the many colored sky. And when you go out there in these perfect observing conditions, hopefully, uh, just think about how the sky is sort of showering you with light in all of these different colors, most of which your eyes can't see, and how much information we can get just by understanding, picking up all the stuff that the sky is showering you with. That's what astronomers are trying to do. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, we have time for a few questions. So raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you so, so we can record. We can front. we have the first question from, yeah, nice, from a kid. That's what I was yeah. thinking. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask, so you stated before that the, the radio waves, uh, when we were looking at the galaxy as a whole in that giant picture, in the, vis in the visible light, you, could, you said that the radio waves can penetrate through gases. Uh, why, uh, why were we able to p pick up those uh, like kind of like star kind of gases with the radio waves? Great question. So uh, radio waves actually penetrate through dust. And you can think of dust as sort of like smoke, sort of like little molecules that are just floating around in space. And that dust happens to be really good at absorbing visible light. However, uh, radio waves are really long wavelengths. So think about like if you were a giant, like you know, if you're trying to just, like, a giant that was, like, 10 miles tall, and you're just walking over, like, little buildings, right, you wouldn't care that the buildings were there. And that's sort of, like, what the radio waves feel like when they're encountering the little molecules of dust. So that's why they, they pass right through. Uh, they, you know, they're just way too big to be affected. The second part of your question uh, was, why don't you see radio waves from stars? And that is a great question. Uh, <coughs> Oh, can you see the dust that like is from this, like all the like space dust? How does the radio wave not penetrate that, and we can actually see that on the radio thing, not from the star? Mm, sorry, I didn't quite understand. <laughs> it's it's okay. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> no, no, no. This means yeah. that Dylan didn't understand your question. question. This is it's a good totally question. Totally my fault. Yeah. Yeah. This Let's is Dylan's talk fault. afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Uh, you said during the survey you'll be taking it like every three years or something and you'll look for stuff that disappears. Um, how would that stuff disappear? Like what kind of stuff would you expect to disappear and, and how? Great question. So uh, one of the ways that a thing can appear or disappear is if it's, if it's an explosion. Say like a supernova goes off or a gamma ray burst goes off. Basically what's going to happen is it's going to be super bright for a short period of time and then it's going to start fading. Uh, as opposed to most of the things that tend to just shine on for millions of years. And so those are the things that I'm looking for, mostly explosions. Yeah, and those are the things that will appear and disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, with so much noise that's going on in the sky, how can you determine or distinguish what is, let's say, a supernova versus what is a star? How do you de determine the difference? That's a great question. So it's actually quite hard to know exactly what you're looking at when you're just looking at a radio image or something. Uh, and so one of the ways that we can identify supernovae is I'm looking at these galaxies uh, which are forming stars. Because supernovae are exploded stars, right? And these stars that explode don't live for very long. So they don't actually travel very far from where they were born. And so you'll see signatures of stars being formed right around where you see this radio source all of a sudden appeared in the sky. And the second clue is uh, actually from the same uh, signatures that tell us that stars are forming, we can tell how far away the thing is. Uh, and so 
when we know how far away the thing is, we know how intrinsically luminous that radio source is. And one of the brightest things that can actually appear in the sky uh, in these sorts of locations is supernovae. And so that's another clue that will point us in the right direction. Um, you said that the, you're applying modern technology to the VLA to, in order to see the new stuff. Um, I'm curious how you're doing that. I mean, I'm imagining these big, huge arrays or antennas. Like, are you doing something to the antennas themselves, or is it technology or replying to the process, what they get? Or like yeah, what they so it's several things. Uh, first of all, between the 1990s when NVSS was taken and the VLA Sky Survey now, the VLA underwent this massive... Uh, back-end hardware upgrade. Uh, so there's a giant supercomputer that uh, sort of crunches all the data, combining all the signals from the telescopes together. <coughs> and because computing technology has improved, we're able to actually uh, crunch a lot more bandwidth at the same time. And so that happened in about 2011, and that's been a huge upgrade to the sensitivity of the very large array. So instead of pointing for several minutes at a time, actually what we can do is we can just point for like the equivalent of five seconds at a time. And that's what the VLA Sky Survey is doing. And one way that we do that is that instead of you know, pointing to a location, observing, pointing to another location, observing, the antennas are really just moving continuously. And uh, there's some clever tricks that were actually developed by my advisor and his student, uh, <laughs> Greg Hallinan and Kunal Muli, uh, where basically you're applying an electronic delay uh, just an artificial delay between in the signal paths between the telescopes. And what that does is it adjusts the direction that your array is pointing in. And we can talk a little bit more about uh, exactly how that works afterwards. But it's called on-the-fly mapping, and it's this new mode of observing that was commissioned at the VLA. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. So out of curiosity, how accurate are auto colors for all the images up there in terms of how much color grading there are and because I'm a photographer and mm -hmm. personally you really have to have like really nice glass to capture that type of saturation <laughs> I would assume that some of it would be not photoshopped but mm -hmm. like how do you get there that's really mm -hmm. cool though yeah yeah great question all of these images are photoshopped <laughs> uh, Basically, what astronomers have are they just have like uh, several filters usually in different colors, right? In the optical, it might just be like red, green, and blue, for example. But in the microwave, for example, it'll be like whatever bands Planck happens to have, like 300 something gigahertz and 200 something gigahertz, right? And so uh, you get intensities, these brightnesses in you know several different colors, and you just apply like you map those to colors that the eyes can see. And then you play with them. You play with the saturation. You play with the, uh, the sort of relative scalings of these colors until it looks nice. And you get these beautiful images. Yeah. Questions? Let's give Dylan another round of applause. All right. So on the panel today, we have several esteemed guests who are all grad students here at Caltech Astro. Nikita studies black holes, x-rays, and active galactic nuclei. She can tell you what those are if you haven't heard of them before. Chris studies fast radio bursts, which are bursts in the radio that are fast. And he also does a lot of, <laughs> he also does a lot of radio instrumentation, so he can answer questions about that. And then Anna studies the deaths of stars, corpses of stars, and something slightly less morbid, radio astronomy. <laughs> so if you have questions about any of these things, or any other questions too, we all have taken courses, lots of courses in astronomy, and we can try to answer whatever questions you have. All right, so I'll be running the mic around. So if anyone has a question, I can bring the mic to you. OK. So um, with the new um, VLA uh, sky survey, is there any specific patterns that you're looking for, or like anything that can tell you where the source of these energies are coming from, or like certain like uh, patterns that like uh, certain areas with you know, similar, um, you know, chemistry and makeup would be uh, producing, like, s similar patterns and, and whatnot, if that makes sense. So that's a good question. 
with these surveys, when you find something that changes in the sky, one of the most difficult parts is actually figuring out what it was. And that can be really, really difficult. So there are various things you can use as clues. One clue would be, where is it? So is it in a galaxy that you can see? Um, if, if you look at a catalog, do you see that there's a galaxy at that position in the sky? Do you see that there's a star at that position in the sky? Um, another clue you could use is uh, how quickly did the thing change? So how quickly did it come and go? Um, and that can sort of tell you what kind of uh, process was possible. Um, you can try to look at information in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you have radio information, you could then look and see if you had information in visible light or infrared light or x-ray light, and that can also give you a clue. Uh, so those are some of the examples for, some, for things you can do. Did I answer your question? We have a question in the back. Hello. Um, I was wondering if, I guess whoever wants to, could go more into depth with the kind of underlying physics, why the radio waves go through the dust, and maybe if it's related, kind of why AM waves would travel farther than FM waves. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the for AM radio waves, they, it's kind of weird to think you can stand on one side of the globe and then look through, and then they make it through the other kind of, through the other side, so uh, that we can see lightning storms from Africa when uh, we're looking over there and Africa is looking somewhere over here. But in the very low frequency radio, the Earth is surrounded by a giant mirror uh, which is the ionosphere. So this is a l the highest layer of the Earth's atmosphere, which is made uh, by the sun uh, ionizing the gas in the uppermost parts of the atmosphere, making it opaque to radio waves. So an AM radio signal is transmitted somewhere on Earth, goes up into space, bounces off the ionosphere, and then uh, back down to Earth and reflect, can reflect off the Earth back to the ionosphere. So it does this ping pong all around the Earth so you can see parts on the other side of, from the other side of the globe, um, if that makes sense. And for why dust, why can radio waves travel through dust instead of traveling and visible light can't. Um, I think, yeah, so if you're a visible light photon, you are very small. Uh, you're only 500 nanometers big, which is much smaller than the size of a typical dust grain. So if you're a visible light uh, if you're a visible light wave, you run up to a dust particle and it looks like a brick wall. Um, it's much bigger than you. It's like me trying to run through that wall in the back. Um, but a radio light wave um, is several feet long, which I don't know what kind of dust particles you're familiar with in your house, but you don't usually find one that's a couple feet big. <laughs> um, so you, I, you can, you can, so it can walk through dust, dust particles like they're nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, there was a recent article uh, on archive.org and I didn't read the whole thing, but it reported the detection of a 100 trillion electron volt photon or cosmic ray. And I was wondering, what in hell is going on out in outer space that could produce something with that much energy? Any ideas? So 
So I'm not familiar with the discovery, but I think in general, one of the outstanding mysteries in astrophysics is where the highest energy cosmic rays come from. I don't, we don't know. Um, I think the general idea is that when you have a shock front, like a shock wave moving, that you can accelerate particles to very high speeds and high energies. And so it's thought that a lot of these high energy things come from uh, processes that produce shock waves. So for example, supernovae produce shock waves, and we think that particles can be accelerated um, at those shock fronts and that those could be the origin of some of the high energy cosmic rays that we see. But I think that problem is, is not solved. Maybe other people have you know, anything to add? Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges to answering this question, uh, I, I didn't actually hear the question, I'm sorry. Was it about like the, uh, the origin of co high energy cosmic rays? Is that it? Of a particularly high energy? Oh, yeah. So there was one that was like, uh, like, you know, 50 joules or something like that. There was like the oh my god particle or whatever it was called. <laughs> it's actually pretty amazing. Like this one little like uh, particle, it's like, you know, several atoms or something uh, is basically, uh, or like an atom a proton, um, is basically like containing the same energy as uh, a major league baseball pitch, just like slamming down. And so, uh, unclear as to you know where this thing comes from. One of the outstanding mysteries of this particle is that it actually can't have traveled very far. It had to come from pretty close because what happens when you have something that is that energetic is it actually interacts with the light that's just floating around in the galaxy, in the universe. And a lot of that light is just the cosmic microwave background. And th that high energy cosmic ray is just gonna scatter off of the cosmic microwave background. And whenever it does that, it loses a lot of energy. And very quickly, it's gonna not be a high energy particle anymore. And so there's sort of a, you know, a maximum amount of distance that it could have traveled to actually reach Earth. And so that really begs the question, where did it come from? You know, somewhere in the galaxy, probably. Um, in, in kind of relation to that, in the, the vision that you showed of the kind of like, almost looked like a watercolor painting with uh, energy kind of frothing around the, the sky. Ha what is that? I mean, have we been able to figure out what that is in terms of the radio, um, with the radio telescope? And the second question being, is there any form of communication or possibility of communication between galaxies that you can see? So the, yeah, so the, a lot of the structure that you see in the radio image is due to uh, electrons in the galaxy moving in the galactic magnetic fields. And in general, when you put electrons with, um, yeah, you put uh, high energy particles in a magnetic field, they start spinning around it. And when they do that, they emit radio waves. So what you're seeing is the, um, yeah, that's what mainly what you're seeing. You're seeing a map of the galactic magnetic fields. Um, in terms of what communicating between galaxies is hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the nearest galaxy comparable to the Milky Way is about 800 uh, kiloparsecs away, which is times three is 2.4 uh, million light years. So any communication we send over there will take 2.4 million years to get there. And if you want a response, 2.4 million more years. <laughs> uh, yep. So I've had this question 
that I've wondered about for a long time and have considered asking at these panels in the past and haven't because I'm afraid it may be a very dumb question. But in light of your presentation tonight, it feels apropos, um, which is not <laughs> – that sounded bad. But <laughs> um, so you, you will often see uh, photographs or you'll hear described that, you know, if you go out into the desert where there's little light pollution, you can, you can look up in the sky and see the Milky Way. And you projected these images at various uh, places in the spectrum of the Milky Way, you know, viewed from uh, viewed in different uh, types of light. So, with the naked eye from the Earth, correct me if I'm wrong. Everything that you would see is in the Milky Way, right? I mean, can you see anything from out with the naked eye that's outside of the galaxy? Okay. So, notwithstanding that, the when you see a, a swath of stars like that and say well, you're seeing the Milky Way, obviously we don't have the perspective from outside the Milky Way to truly look straight on at the Milky Way. So, what is what are you really seeing when when people say you're seeing the Milky Way or just seeing one uh, an, an arm of the Milky Way, a stretch, a, just a a bunch of stars um, that you know that that look like uh, they're clustered together, but really are just over an enormous expanse of space. And then related to that, uh, or on the same subject, those uh, images that you showed, uh, obviously they're not, we don't have the ability to take images of the Milky Way from outside the galaxy. So ha has there been, you talked about Photoshopping, has there been some kind of manipulation there to make it appear as if you're looking edge on at the galaxy or, or, or it's just we're looking in the direction of the center and this is the this is the uh, cross section that we get when we when we do that. Yes. Yeah, so to answer the first part of your question, when we look up at the night sky, yeah, a lot of the objects, the points of light that we see are from um, inside our own galaxy. So those are the stars that we see, um, you know, within the Milky Way. But there are objects. There are deep sky objects that you can uh, see with the naked eye. Um, you can see galaxies with the naked eye. So like as Chris was talking about, our, our nearest spiral galaxy neighbor that's 2 million light years away, you can see that with your naked eye as a little fuzzy patch in the sky. And I encourage you to... Yeah, I encourage you, like, if you get the chance to um, go to a, a, a dark... Um, uh, a dark site to uh, try and uh, look for the Andromeda galaxy. Um, it just looks like a fuzzy patch in the sky, but you can, there are galaxies that you can uh, resolve with your own naked eye. Grab a pair of binoculars and you can see other satellite galaxies. Go down to the southern hemisphere, you can see the Me Magellanic clouds. Um, so yeah, uh, we're not just seeing the light from within our galaxy. There are many, many deep sky objects out there. And, you know, telescopes have become so powerful now that we can even resolve, you know, explosions of individual stars in very distant galaxies. Um, and I myself study everything, like all, all the brightest galaxies that are, you know, um, harboring very massive, uh, supermassive black holes in their center and are really bright in the x-rays. Um, so then to move on to the second part of your question, um, those... Uh, individual composite images that you're seeing in different wavelength bands. Obviously, our eyes are only sensitive to the visible, and we use uh, different types of telescopes to construct images and different wavelength bands from the radio through to gamma rays. And um, the, the band through the center is you are, we are basically situated on one of the outer arms of the Milky Way called the Orion Arm. And so we're looking through to the center of the Milky Way. So the band that you see across the sky, that's the band that we can see being situated in one of these arms of the Milky Way. Um, those images are not photoshopped in such a way that we can project outside um, the plane of our galaxy. We are looking through into, the, into that plane of the galaxy. So it's the line of sight. Um, Other stars that are visible with the naked eye in the sky, you know, just in familiar constellations in Orion or or whatever, these are also stars in the same arm of the galaxy, right? Um, not, necessarily not necessarily within the same arm, but um, again, we are looking into the plane of the Milky Way, but stars are not all confined to that 
there is some dispersion of stars above and below the plane of the Milky Way, and that's okay. why you can see stars out outside of that plane. <laughs> what is the most frustrating thing about astronomy to you personally? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this sounds like one of those questions that we want to go down the panel because everybody will have a different perspective. Um, I think the most frustrating thing about astronomy, uh, I mean, there are many frustrating things about astronomy. <laughs> you know, there, there are many like day to day frustrations, as in, like, oh, my code's not working, or like, you know, I like, you know, made this stupid mistake and now I have to like do it over again and I just like lost eight hours of work. That kind of stuff happens all the time, right? But I think uh, the most frustrating thing, is, like on a sort of grand scheme, is that there are all these people who like would be really, really great astronomers, and a lot of them don't get the chance to do astronomy. And so I think that uh, that's definitely something that we as a field need to work towards. Yeah, just to echo Dylan, like us as grad students have our day-to-day -day struggles and, you know, the, it, I mean, doing research as a grad student is really like a sinusoid and there are lots of ups and downs, um, you know, and like the picture you have of like, you know, as a, you know, uh, undergraduate, you know, trying to having this interest in astronomy and then like realizing what day-to-day -day research is really like. Um, it, it can be difficult at times because, you know, research is unpredictable. You don't know what direction it's going to go in. You can't just expect that, you know, your hypothesis is going to work out. And I think some aspects of astronomy research that are really, you know, frustrating is the, these telescopes that we're using, they're amazing. They take amazing data, but it's really, really hard to get time on those telescopes. And so, you know, researchers have to write these... Um, you know, spent a lot of time writing up these proposals to try and uh, get time on these telescopes to do this kind of science that we do. And it's a shame how oversubscribed these um, instruments are becoming and how difficult it is to actually, you know, get real-time data um, over the course of your graduate career, um, which is partly why I work with archival data. But... Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's uh, another frustrating aspect is, um, you know, if you want to use something like Hubble, it's like a factor of 10 over subscription rate. Um, it's really hard to like actually, you know, get, get telescope time, <laughs> even at Caltech. Yeah. To um, add on to that, if you want Another way to get data is to build your own instrument, which also takes a large amount of time and effort. Um, and in general, in astronomy, it's the results that you work so hard towards, they only come, they come years after you start the journey and your yeah, you have to have the, uh, a lot of persistence is required to see something all the way through to the end and produce uh, the useful bit of knowledge that uh, you've been working towards. So you can go uh, years without seeing the fruits of your labor. And then the most extreme example is, I think, um, LIGO, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a, a observatory that looks for gravitational waves from black holes colliding and neutron stars merging. Uh, to get any detection out of that instrument took 30 years. Um, and it, it was a ac real accomplishment when it happened, but for 30 years wondering if you're ever going to see a gravitational wave must have been hard. 
Yeah, I very much agree with everything that's been said. I was trying to think of something to say that was particular to what I work on. And I guess in my field, it's a bit unusual in the sense that the phenomena that I'm studying, these are explosions, and they're over in a few days. And so you have to be extremely fast at catching them and reacting to them, and you can miss them quite easily. Uh, and as a graduate student, I think one of the challenges is that you are an amateur, basically. You're new to a field, and so you make a lot of mistakes. And I think uh, the work that I'm doing can be unforgiving because you can make a mistake uh, and miss something, and that's just too bad. And that's happened to me a number of times already, and so learning to, um, uh, learning to deal with that has been a challenging aspect of what I do. So then I'm curious, what keeps each of you going through the difficulties? I do want to say that frustration is probably not the main feeling that I have in my work. So that is something that is, something that is frustrating, but um, I very much feel lucky to do what I'm doing. And I think that the, I feel like often in research, you get sort of, uh, you get these very strong rewards when you finally discover something or something finally makes sense. And then in between, it can be incredibly frustrating. And so you sort of um, go up and down. And I think it's important to not tie yourself emotionally too closely to those, to how your work is going, because otherwise you'll ride that as well. <laughs> it's not a fun ride to be on. I think especially because the uh, down parts are last much longer than the up parts. Um, yeah, for me, I... <sighs> Yeah, I'm pretty motivated by uh, doing something new and being able to answer a question that uh, nobody has asked before and looking at the universe in a new way that even if it doesn't, yeah, even if uh, we don't find what we're hoping to find, we will know something new anyway. Yeah, I agree with what's been uh, said. And like really that that innate passion that I had like since I was a child, you know, I, I had that curiosity of like and just the scale of like you as a human on this earth in the Milky Way, part of many millions of other galaxies out there in this vast universe. Like to this day, that kind of scale it's still, it's, it's just amazing. It, it really is mind blowing. And I think, you know, research will always have its ups, ups and downs, but especially at a place like Caltech, I, I really am like grateful for the wealth of tools and facilities that are available to me. And I'm also motivated by the amazing research that's going on all around me and just, you know, like hearing about everyone else's research and, and like, all the awesome work that people do and it's it's kind of pushes you you know you can you can do great things and and you know this is a, an amazing field and it, it it's rewarding if you if you maintain that passion for it i think that uh, i really want to echo what anna said which is uh about not tying yourself too much to your work uh, and I used to do that a lot. And one of the things that helped me dispel this was sort of just accepting that, uh, you know, there's this whole conception that, oh, you have to be a genius to do science, right? Uh, and, you know, once I sort of managed to purge that from my system, uh, <laughs> this feeling that, like, you know, when I'm failing in science, that means that like I'm not capable, or that reflects something like deeper about myself. Uh, you know, I think sort of managing to untie that uh, has been really helpful for me. And one other thing that I think is really important is just building community among the people who you work with. Uh, I think I have some really really good friends who are also grad students uh, in Caltech astronomy and. We support each other, and you know everybody is down days, but that's what you have friends for. <laughs> okay, I'm going to abuse my moderator privilege for four or five seconds and just say that one of the other things that keeps us going, so it's really easy, as everyone has mentioned, to get tied to these 
day-to-day -day frustrations. But one thing that keeps, I think, all of us going are you and people like you and getting to talk with other people who don't do astronomy, who also get excited about astronomy. And that helps remind us, you know, why we have this passion and why we continue to do it. Okay. Sorry, next question. Um, well, it kind of segues from that. So one of the things that gets a lot of people interested in astronomy, certainly like lay people, but, but even to get people to want to pursue the field of astronomy uh, professionally is exploration of space. You know, we talk about like the Apollo effect, for example, and how many people went into the field after the Apollo program and so forth. So the things that you guys are studying are things that, uh, you know, barring some technological <laughs> revolution that is inconceivable at this point, you, they cannot be explored. They can only be observed at a distance. So um, I guess the first thing is, uh, what inspired you t to get interested in, in these faraway objects and, and you know, to, to want to pursue a career studying them? And second, do you, do you guys, are you guys just utterly disinterested in space exploration? I mean, or or do you, are you also interested in that, but it's just like, just has nothing to do with what you're studying? Yeah. Uh, I guess we can also go down the panel again. Um, I think that space exploration is cool. That's not what brought me into astronomy. I, like, I guess one of the first things that I enjoyed was math, and that was really just like, uh, you know, all these like abstract concepts, and I just sort of like liked thinking about things that might be out there or like beautiful ideas, and that's kind of like what astronomy feels like to me, right? Uh, I don't need to actually be able to touch the gamma ray burst. I actually hope I never do. <laughs> but knowing that they're out there, that's cool. Uh, and that's sort of like, the thing that, as a human, like uh, keeps me motivated day to day. One of the things uh, with my research. Yeah, for me, I think it was uh, when I was a kid. I, you know, I was always fascinated by the night sky. But then one day, I, I opened up this book, which is like a compilation of, uh, you know, um, many like uh, Hubble images of you know, uh, various astronomical objects, and I just. I was just reading and I was just like completely blown away by the fact how long the light took to reach our eyes. So there's this very famous um, Hubble image which is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which is this um, basically Hubble stared at a blank patch of sky for 11 days. And then from, from that 11 day exposure, you could see hundreds of thousands of galaxies down a 13 billion light year corridor. Our universe is, is almost 14 billion years old. And so the light from, we were seeing light from galaxies that have been traveling to us throughout the entirety of the history of the universe. We were seeing, you know, the very first light from the very first galaxies. And that just really, it really blew my mind, the scale, the scale of things, how long that light took to reach our eyes. And then when I, when I looked at the night sky and I, I saw my first deep sky object, the Orion Nebula, and I was like, that's 2,000 light years away. It, it took 2,000 years for that light to reach my eyes. I'm looking back in time. And so that really blew my mind. And yeah, I, that really sort of got me hooked into astronomy and yeah. Yeah, I mean, just if you think about, you know, exoplanet research is really booming right now. Like, you know, we, we're living in our solar system. It's just, you know, our sun is just one of many billions of stars. Every every star probably has an, its own solar system with its own planets surrounding it. And, you know, we're beginning to find more and more planets that are like our own Earth and that could potentially harbor life. And so, you know, it's I think it's a very big possibility that there must be life out there. Um, and uh, along the same lines of space exploration, I think while it didn't, it wasn't the main motivator for me to pursue astronomy research. I, I still one day want to travel on Virgin Galactic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, for me it was um, good math and science teachers who exposed uh, 
me to the current state of the art of the field and presented their class not as uh, this is what we learned if from the 1600s to the 1950s and uh, it kind of stops and not exposing uh, us to what's going on now and didn't present like this as a solved problem. Um, they, yeah, they let the class know that there's still a lot that we don't know and um, it's somebody should go and figure it out. Um, so for, yeah, I think space exploration is uh, cool, but what motivates me is the knowledge that you can learn from uh, sending stuff out into space and uh, tell us about how the solar system formed and um, how we got here. So I think my path to astronomy can be described uh, with four books that I read. So the first book was called uh, The Fabric of the Cosmos by Brian Greene, which I read, I read, I borrowed from my science teacher in eighth grade and skimmed and thought, I'm going to be a theoretical physicist, which I would never say now. <laughs> um, and then uh, in high school, I read a book by the neurologist Oliver Sacks. And around that time, I was starting to think that although I thought astronomy was interesting, I would never actually want to do it as a career because from what I read, it seemed incredibly lonely and isolating. And I, was, I pictured I had a very vivid image of what a scientist was, which was this extremely intelligent person just working by themselves, and it sounded terrible. But I was sort of fascinated. It was sort of like reading about you know, some Arctic explorer. It's like, that's so hardcore, but I would never do that. Um, so in high school, I changed my mind. And so when I went to college, I actually was pre-med. So I was majoring in physics, but I was sort of taking the pre-med uh, sequence and planning to become a neurologist. And then, uh, oh, I guess I'm going to just do three books. I'm going to skip part of this story. Uh, so then uh, at some point in college, around my sophomore year, I was shadowing doctors at the hospital and deciding that maybe this was actually not really what I wanted to do because I had pictured being a doctor as being basically being a scientist plus getting to help people. But it's very different from being a scientist. And so I thought, well, maybe I should just try, uh, try astronomy or something else and get it out of my system. So I went around uh, my uh, university talking to various professors and saying, what do you do from, on a day-to-day -day basis? And one of the astronomers I talked to, uh, he said, read this book. This will tell you what it's like to be an astronomer. Uh, and it's this book called First Light by uh, Richard Preston. And it actually takes place in the 1960s at Palomar Observatory, which is run by Caltech. It's about a two and a half hour drive from here. And that's the observatory I work with now, uh, which I you know, couldn't have foreseen at the time. But I loved that book, and so I thought, well, I'll just do one astronomy internship. So I did one astronomy internship at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is what Dylan was just talking about. And it was very different from what I had expected. And actually, it was really interesting because, so my favorite classes in school were always humanities, always literature. I mean, I liked, I was, I liked all my classes, but I think my favorites, the ones I enjoyed the most were always history and English. And the reasons for that I realized only much later is that the work I'm doing now actually much more resembles what those classes were like. It was very interactive. You, know, you read stuff, you discuss, you argue, you give talks, you write papers. Um, it really doesn't resemble very much what at least my science classes looked like, which was that I was just sitting there and kind of intaking information, which is not my style, it turns out. Um, and so when I actually got to do research, it turned out to be very different from what uh, what I had imagined before. And I mean, I was lucky. I had a really energetic, uh, really great advisor for that first research project and a really interesting project. I was also volunteering on the weekends, sort of in a setting like this. And so I, I sort of felt like what I'd been looking for in being a doctor was actually met by that combination of research and then also engaging with the public. So um, yeah, those are three books that brought me here. Yeah, I wanted to follow uh, up on something that Anna mentioned earlier, and that was uh, when a star novas uh, 
typically you're not looking at it when that happens, so you catch it a day or two later. Is there any critical information that you're missing because you're not seeing it? And is it possible to extrapolate back the light curve that you do detect to maybe recover some of that information? Yes, that's a good question. So one of the things that I'm actually doing is trying to get very, very early light curves for supernovae. And we really, we now know that we did not know what they were going to look like. Um, I guess we had the guesses and we were wrong. Um, and so one of the explosions that I recently worked on, um, so this was an explosion that appeared in the sky uh, September 9th of last year, 2018. And that was really special because we actually got the light curve within half an hour or an hour uh, of the of the light from the explosion first arriving at Earth anyway. So. And that was a spectacular, um, it was amazing to see that, I guess. And, and then, so it was amazing to see, to see that, but then what happened is that we, okay, how do I explain this? So we had many, many images, and so it was not seen, not seen, not seen, not seen, 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 seen. And what we were able to do later is we were able to go back and take those images where it was not seen, and we stacked them together to look for fainter detections, we actually saw it. So it extended all the way, so it was seen, 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 and we thought, uh-oh, <laughs> seen. So when was the actual explosion? I actually have no idea. Um, and it's just very difficult to say what was happening at those early times. So I don't know that I'm really answering your question. I guess, so there are certain things that you learn from the very early data. You can learn what the star was actually like when it exploded, so how big was it, for example? is a key number, like just the size of the star that we often don't know in these explosions. And that's something that you lose information about very quickly if you're too late. Um, but I guess all that is also to say that that very early data, we're only just starting to get it and we don't understand it yet. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that that uh, there's actually something even earlier than when you can see the optical light, which is that when a star explodes, it starts from the core, right? And that core uh, sends out a shock wave that has to ripple through the star itself. Right? And so you really only see light when the shock wave reaches the surface of the star. Uh, and we've seen that a couple times. It's called shock breakout. It actually, like, uh, there's a super, super lucky observation by then grad student Alicia Soderberg at Caltech, where she was just like observing, you know, an entirely unrelated explosion and uh, happened to catch a supernova just as it went off, and you saw that flash of x-rays. Uh, and so that's one thing, is when the shock just reaches the surface of the star. But even before that, right, like what's going on as the shock wave is propagating through the stars, uh, th through the star? You can't see that in like any electromagnetic light because the star is just too thick. Uh, it just blocks all the light. Um, and so maybe in the far future, we'll get lots of neutrinos, for example, coming from you know, the seconds as the core is starting to collapse. And uh, that might help tell us what's going on really as the explosion is happening. So it's one thing I'm looking forward to. It's, it's still like w way far away, but I think it'd be cool. Hi, um, I had a question. Um, has there been any real interest in building another um, very large array to see the spot that we're missing? Is that something worth investing in? Absolutely. So uh, astronomy is currently undergoing what's called the decadal review. So every 10 years, uh, the entire astronomical community gets together and you know people write lots of uh, papers called white papers basically saying hey wouldn't it be cool if we as a field decided to do this and oftentimes do this means like build this instrument uh, and so one of the big instruments that's being pushed at least by the radio astronomy community is called the ngvla or the next generation vla Astronomers are great at naming things. <laughs> um, and what that's going to do is basically it's going to upgrade all the antennas that were built in the 1970s and are really actually like starting to uh, deteriorate. Uh, and it's going to like turn the 27 dishes into like 200 dishes or something like that, 250 something. Uh, and, with, and the idea is that they're going to be spaced out in a way that uh, we now know is more optimal for being able to reconstruct images fast. 
Uh, some of these antennas are going to be located in much, much farther uh, flung areas, such as, like, currently it's just on, this, on the plains in New Mexico, but some of these antennas will be in Texas, some of them will be in California, some of them will be in, like, Arizona, some will be in Mexico. And so what that does by spacing out your antennas uh, is it gives you much, much higher resolution as well. And one of the things that people really want as well is to be able to push the actual uh, receivers, the, the things that catch the light coming in, uh, to be able to operate at higher and higher frequencies. And that <coughs> basically allows you to see different parts of the universe uh, and different things that you couldn't have seen before. So one of the things that I think Anna and I are both very excited about is that uh, radio supernovae tend to be very bright in uh, early times at very high frequencies. And, you know, it sort of rapidly drops uh, in where it's bright to lower and lower frequencies. And so wouldn't it be cool if we could just see that entire evolution and have an instrument that was just sensitive to all those frequencies uh, and be able to do it at super high resolution? I think that'd be cool. <laughs> Do we have any other do we have any other questions? All right, we do have questions. Uh, yep. Simple question, maybe. Uh just one of the slides you showed was the uh black hole that uh kind of destroyed a star. How long was the time scale for that to happen? Ooh, good question. Uh do you know Anna, like what the time scale for T D is? Um, I think there are several uh, properties of the system that determine like the time scale, and also the there's also a question of what wavelength you're looking at. So there are like two different classes of tidal disruption events: those that you see as flashes at, in the X-rays, and then those that you see as flashes in the optical. Um, and uh, a big factor that determines the time scale is the mass of the black hole and the mass of the star that's being ripped apart. Um, so I think it can range from like days to weeks to months, maybe. Yeah. As you scale with the mass of the black hole, the time scales become longer for things. But uh, but the movie you sh showed was that a simulation or was it actually an observation of? That was a simulation. Oh, okay. And oh, okay, okay. Yeah, oh, I thought it was an observation. observation. simulation. I'm completely fascinated by it. <laughs> Yes, the study of these TDEs is very much still in its infancy, and some of the things that people say are TDEs, others disagree and say that actually was not a TDE, that was something else. And this goes back to the question that somebody was asking about, when you see one of these things, how do you know what it was? You just saw something change, and so people have ways of guessing that something was likely to be a TDE. So for example, if it's exactly located in the center of a galaxy, um, but you could have a supernova there too, so it's hard to say. And I think the, I guess the TDEs, I don't work directly on this, but I've sort of seen, we have a, a sort of interface where everyone can log in and see all the various explosions that are happening in the sky. And so when I've seen TDEs on there, they tend to be sort of months. They're kind of, that too, which to me sounds long compared to normal explosions. Um, and those are for the usual supermassive black holes. People are interested in finding TDEs that could be around stellar mass black holes, and then that would be more like days to weeks. Uh, however, I think the emission mechanism, so the physical process that's giving rise to this light, we don't actually know what part of the TDE process is doing that. And so it's hard to sort of map what we're seeing directly to some time scale of some physical process. Yeah, I guess like uh, nobody really understands all of the uh, physical mechanisms for what we're seeing. Uh, one thing that I think people generally agree that is important, though, is uh, the timescales over which things fall into the black hole, because where you're actually getting that energy out is converting the gravitational potential energy uh, of things outside of this huge, deep potential well into uh, light, right? And so, uh, you know, there's all these uh, interesting sorts of things that uh, might happen in the TDEs. People talk about like uh, how it might be actually hard to get rid of the angular momentum of the stuff that's falling in. And one way that you have to do that is maybe you have streams uh, intersecting with themselves, these like stream-stream collisions that 
are able to dissipate some of that angular momentum, uh, but nobody really knows what's actually going on. Lots of people are simulating this. People are trying to uh, see it from the observational side, and slowly a picture will coalesce, but it's very much in its infancy, like Anna was saying. Um, I know with black holes and maybe pulsars, I'm not an expert at all, uh, you get streams of emitted rays going um, opposite each other. What determines the direction of these? Like, wh like, why do they go that way? Like, why do planets come in, maybe in the disk? Is that, like, what's the physics behind that? So when matter falls into a black hole, um, so yeah, there are different scenarios. Like when we talk about tidal disruption events, it's you've got a single star being ripped apart by the gravitational influence of the black hole. Um, but normally, the kind of scenario that you have is that um, like the gas that's around a black hole, and especially the very massive black holes, um, has some angular momentum. And so um, usually what you find is that matter will form what's called an accretion disk around a black hole. And, um, and the way that you know, matter is basically transported inwards and angular momentum is transported outwards um, is because there's friction between like uh, different annuli basically moving at different speeds. And, um, and that's how matter basically falls into the black hole and, and, and angular momentum is transported out. And as matter falls into the black hole, um, you know, you can have lots of physical processes going on that can produce uh, jets that can have outflows in the polar regions, and so that's how you see these, you know, these um, kind of streams coming uh, perpendicular to the black hole. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything. But, yeah, generally matter tends to circularize in its orbit, and if you have a lot of matter, it's going to form an accretion disk. Yeah, I guess uh, one more thing to add on to that is that it's generally thought that uh, magnetic fields are really important in launching these jets. Uh, nobody really quite understands the mechanism or where these magnetic fields are anchored. Some people think that it's anchored in the black hole itself. Some people think that it's anchored in the accretion disk and the stuff that's falling into the black hole. But uh, I think the picture I have in my head, and I'm not sure if it's 100% correct, is that you sort of get these twisted up magnetic fields and you get particles that uh, stream along them and are confined by them and sort of like spiral outwards and just get ejected. And so ways that you can twist up magnetic fields, which are actually kind of scary, uh, <laughs> like scary and that they're hard to understand, um, are, will be important in determining like exactly what the properties of the jets are. Yeah, so like one way, like one popular theoretical idea of how you launch jets is that uh, black holes are, there's this no hair theorem basically, like black holes are characterized by very few things. Basically it's mass, charge, and spin. Um, and so black holes can rotate and that's what the spin parameter of the black hole describes. And so that rotation of the black hole can possibly be the mechanism that's winding up these magnetic fields. And then charged particles like protons and electrons um, then can be accelerated along those magnetic field lines and launch jets. Cool. Any questions? This is your chance to ask astronomers anything. You can ask them what their favorite books are. Or just, there are no dumb questions here. I have asked many more dumb questions than I don't. I think anyone can in this single session. Are we doing anything about light pollution on the planet? Yeah. So there are a number of groups um, working on light, working on. Uh, light pollution, and uh, in particular, people right now are worried about mega constellations of satellites uh, that <laughs> uh, co different companies are planning on launching and uh, trying to get the 
astronomer's voice heard and so that if if these uh, constellations of satellites launch and um, in any given part of the sky you will be able to see yeah they'll run streaks through all of your image if it's at the right time of night uh, so that the satellite reflects light from the sun and down onto earth uh, and making sure that um, if these do launch they are dim um, yeah and aside from the optical light pollution there's also a problem of radio frequency interference which is all of the man-made stuff um, that leaks into our radio telescopes and causes us to lose data um, so there's there are some protected bands in um, yeah there are a number of protected bands in the spectrum that are protected by the FCC uh, one one around the 21 centimeter hydrogen line and um, a couple other places about the spectrum but uh, in general the yeah these bands are small and we are looking primarily in uh, bands of radio in radio bands that are allocated for other types of things so we have to go to more and more uh, remote sites to get away from them and even in these protected bands I have um, my own instrument and I have taken data for a week and looked for every I observe in one of these protected bands and uh, I think it should be a little bit more protected there's stuff there um, <laughs> um, yeah but there are groups of people who are co coordinating politically to uh, protect both the optical sky and the radio sky. Yeah, uh, Nikita, you were talking about angular momentum and black holes a little bit ago. Uh, in a destructive tidal event, when a star, say, is captured by a black hole, it won't necessarily align itself with the uh, black hole's uh, rotational axis. Will the accretion disk automatically adjust itself to that, or will it cause the black hole to wobble in some way? Yes, that's a great question. And um, when talking about, you know, uh, trajectories of the star that is being disrupted by the black hole, is it's, it's quite an open area of research, and there are a lot of simulations being done on, on like whether an accretion disk is even formed or not. So what's happening, what we think is happening is that, um, you know, that there's a star on this sort of parabolic orbit um, around a black hole, and then at its closest approach in that parabolic orbit is when, it, uh, when its distance from the black hole is within the tidal radius. And so it, it basically begins to get tidally disrupted, and um, half the star is basically uh, ripped apart. And in that process, and this is where this, you know, people have been simulating you know, what, what would be the stellar trajectory um, of the disrupted material, and how does that actually form an accretion disk and the alignment of that accretion disk relative to the way that black holes is spinning. Um, I don't think people really know about that. And the hard thing is it's hard from the data to deduce something about it. Um, Again, with TDEs, like Anna and Dylan were saying, it's really hard to try and determine whether an event is a TDE event or just some, you know, supernova explosion or some flare in a black hole. Um, and really, all we really know is from the shape of the light curve, which is like the intensity of the light that we see over time, we know that for tidal disruption events, they have a very sort of characteristic shape. And that kind of defines what, what the TDE is. But um, it's hard to get other information about, you know, you can't really determine, like, alignments of, of the accretion disk with respect to the black hole. It's, it's hard to model those kinds of phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or... Yeah, like we don't even know like the alignments of, of you know jets that are launched from black holes and their alignment relative to the 
galactic plane as a whole. I mean, that's why it's useful to look at these things in the radio, because you can look at the blobs of, of radio emission, and that tells you about the alignment of, of the radio jet with respect to jets uh, that we see at other wavelengths. Uh, so Anna, you gave us a couple books that really inspired you to study astronomy. For all of you guys, are there any books or documentaries or YouTube videos, anything you've seen lately that have just gotten you really hype that you'd recommend? One of my favorite books uh, that's like mathy and sciencey, but not about astronomy, is uh, Godel Escher Bach. Uh, it's a great book. Um, I don't even know how to describe it, but uh, it's about literally everything, just like beautiful ideas uh, in like in puzzles. Uh, Godel Escher Bach, yeah, um, and I guess uh, the one thing I can say about it is that. I picked it up in high school, and I read a couple of chapters, and then I had to just stop reading it because I was just too excited, and then I had to, like, sort of <laughs> take a walk and cool down and, like, go back to reading it. That's, like, never happened to me with any other book. So go to Al-Shabak, great book, read it. Yeah, I don't think I have any particular, like, specific book that... I can recall the name of because I, I got into astronomy when I was circa 10 years old. Um, but yeah, I, I, I remember as a kid, you know, I loved going on, you know, Hubble site and, you know, like, you know, astronomy picture of the day and like seeing all those images and, you know, Hubble site also has really, um, and NASA, if you go to the um, websites of like specific in like missions that you're interested in, um, you know, they have really good, uh, like, you know, they explain the science in a very good, like, uh, clear to understand lay manner. Um, and yeah, I don't think there's like any specific, I wasn't really like, uh, big into reading like science specific, like books written by, by science authors or like really watching documentaries. For me, it was very like a personal thing of me, like, you know, being out there and, and, and like looking at the night sky and, and then like reading up on various things on whether it's like how does a, this telescope work and then reading a bunch of books on like how you know like a Dobsonian telescope works or a reflector or whatever and then yeah there isn't like a specific book by a specific author that got me into astronomy. Yeah for me it was yeah more the personal connections rather than anything I read. I don't know if I could give something out right now. It all just seems like a blur of popular science when I was younger. <laughs> Sorry. Cool. Any other questions? I'm glad no one mentioned Interstellar because I hate that movie. I just don't... <laughs> I don't like Matthew McConaughey. Okay, anyway. <laughs> I think if there aren't any other questions, we're going to... Oh, sorry, Anna, can I just sorry, ask, was that specifically astronomy physics books? <sighs> like science books? Okay. <laughs> just because I don't really... I feel like now I don't read that much astronomy because when I'm not doing astronomy, I don't want to be thinking about astronomy. <laughs> um, but I, I will pitch one... Of, I mentioned that I like to read these books by Oliver Sacks. And so I'll n name a couple of those. So one of them is called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And so these are collections of case studies of people with sort of interesting, um, or, or interesting, it's kind of a cruel word, but just unusual neurological disorders. And um, I mean, I think in learning about the brain, one way, and one of the main ways that we've learned about how it works is by finding the weird cases. And I think it's actually similar in astronomy. It's the, it's the weird explosions that actually teach you a lot about the underlying physical phenomena. Um, and another book by him that I really like is called Awakenings, and that's about a uh, sleeping sickness epidemic in the 19, 1917, 1918. And people, yeah, they fell ill with this and then were basically, I think, comatose for decades, and then were woken up 50 years later by the invention of a new kind of medication. And then they were, then they 
they had a lot of Parkinsonian symptoms, but there's a chapter in this book called Parkinsonian Space and Time that I really liked. And so it was describing the way that these patients had very different perceptions of space and the passage of time from sort of healthy people and sort of comparing it to principles from relativity. And it's super interesting. So I recommend that book. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I think we're going to wrap up this panel for the night. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And yeah, have a good night. <laughs>